the, the thing is, the business of audiobooks is, is to me so fascinating. Uh, you know, where's the market and how do you produce the audiobook at a rate that is affordable for the independents? Because all the big publishers like Penguin Random House and Hachette, like they, they all have their own studios and uh, like Penguin Random House is now um, doing everything they publish is also published in audio. So um, everything, everything. Uh, so and they're so that was starting last year. Uh, they're getting all three formats, so ebook and print and uh, and audio, and then they're trying to get their backlist also which, recorded, which is too. good for narrators. Which is huge, yeah. yeah. But but again, uh, they're a big company, so they have the um, they can afford to have narrators on staff who just sit there and record all day and uh, uh, but. I, to me, the bigger market is is looking at the independent publishers, like uh, who maybe do five or six titles a year or less, or they're you know independent authors, and you know how do they get something in audio? Everybody's telling them to do it, but um, there's that upfront cost, and uh, you have to be a good marketer. You have to be able to to sell enough books. Um, I kind of think of it the same as you. Do you remember? Uh, probably 15 years ago, you would go to get your book published and printed, and they would say, "You know, if you print 10,000, you'll you get, get a deal. deal. It's oh, only they still 50, say that. yeah, 50 cents a book." Yeah. And you go, "Wow, that's a great idea!" And then you're stuck with all these books that you can't sell because the bestseller in Canada is 3,000 books. Yeah. So, what I what I yeah. advise is yeah. is as being a tiny mm. little publisher sort of mm. um, is print on demand. Mm -hmm. Let's order this many because it's not just about the money. It's also about your comfort level and you're going to sit in this mountain of books in your house and yeah. it's going to stress you out that you, Oh my God, I'm sitting on this big mountain and I have to move this before I can make any money. It, it, yeah. At least oh. then they, they can continually gauge where they're at. Exactly. So you're paying higher per per book price, but you're you know, your stress I mean, and, yeah. and you you're not making furniture out of boxes of books and uh, and, and it's a risk too, you know, if something happens, you have a flood or something happens in your house or whatever. You've lost the product. It, and well so similarly, um, an audiobook if you're going to go whole hog and you know hire the narrator and uh, and get everything, it can be really pricey. And if you don't have the means to um, sell those books, those audiobooks, you're going to be you know, like paying out a ton of money and then seeing no income, and mm -hmm. that's really discouraging for everybody. Uh, so I my next plan, like I have been a, just a narrator up until. Uh, last couple months and my my expansion plan for the coming year is to be an audiobook publisher my my husband and I have a company and it's uh, engineering and man project management services and audiobooks <laughs> no. so but that's the that's the plan is like I, I want to be able to do affordable audiobooks for small Canadian publishers. Good um, tagline. That, yeah, like that's that's where I want because the Canadian market is uh, for publishers is very different than the American market, um, and nobody we're all trying to follow the American model because mm -hmm. it's worked with Audible. Uh, that's they they sell the vast majority of of audiobooks in the states, but in Canada. More of the audiobooks get um, listened to through libraries, and Canadians will listen to audiobooks in libraries, and and not as much through the download uh, monthly service that mm. Audible is. Now I did a little bit of research mm. myself on that before we put out this audiobook yeah. by going into the library, and they used to have this really big selection of you know DVD movies and yeah. audiobooks, and, audiobooks. <laughs> and there was one skinny little shelf of audiobooks. And that was it. Because they're all oh, download CD. now. Yeah. Through, uh, yeah, like the, there's very few audiobooks uh, now on CD um, because it's cheaper to just do them digital download. Uh, and so every library in Canada has um, a service, a download service through like Overdrive and Hoopla and 
uh, but like there's there's some that yeah. specifically are for the um, the library market, and that is where Canadians listen to audiobooks. And right now there's a, a real struggle because um, audiobook publishers charge libraries so much for an audiobook yes. that and and some of them they don't even have access to a lot of the the really popular books that are out there the libraries can't even get them because the distributors have decided not to give it to libraries but to sell it instead uh, so so the, but i think that that that's an economic fight that's going to it'll it'll work itself out eventually like but they could probably get it at better rates from you know, smaller publishers that's what i'm thinking but uh, so why aren't yeah. they doing that do they think that the quality's not there it seems like they're only buying from these sources because the, well because they're the big publishers so that that's where it is so i'm i'm still looking into that but i really i really think that uh our, in Canada, our sales are going to be different than the system that they've got set up in the States. And it, it's kind of hard to tell. You have to do a lot of research. Um, but uh, if, if, you have, if you're a Canadian publisher and your audience is in Canada, this is where you're going to have to sell audiobooks. Just uh, because just uh, for a Canadian publisher to put their stuff up on audible in the united states it gets lost there yeah. there's like and it's really hard to market uh, it's, it's because it's just such an overwhelmingly ponderous huge huge market th there's so many books out there and uh, so there has to be a way to distinguish yourself and uh, and i i i know like canadian publishers are all bigger than any american publisher it's uh Canadians read books. Canadians listen to books, and and our media um, is supportive. Yeah, you know, yeah. you call the newspapers, and they're like, "Oh, a book, a, a book. Maybe, yeah. maybe we'll talk to you." Yeah, and the states read. are like, uh, "Another one." So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Book. so, uh, so you know, it's it's a whole different market, and I I kind of liken that to you know when Target Canada came came in yeah. and misjudged the entire Canadian market so fast that you know within two years they fled with their tail between well, their legs. Yeah, we checked out. They just they were selling weird stuff that. Yeah, they said, well, it works in the states. Surely it will. We can just open stores in yeah. Canada. And uh, but I I don't think so. And I I think um, because Audible opened the the .dot ca uh, be a year and a half ago now. Mm -hmm. um, and. They they just use the same model as in the states, and I don't think they've got quite the traction that they were hoping for. Uh, it hasn't grown because Canadians don't really want to have a subscription service. They go to libraries, and, uh, and that's where they're, they're. Well, some Canadians do the subscription service. Oh, some. Well, I happen to live with one. <laughs> <laughs> I but, think it depends how many how many books you go. Is through. that because we're cheap, or is it because we're more into? Trusting the system, or the I, well, that's a really good question. I hate to say we're cheap. We are thrifty. Canadians really look at where we're spending our money, but uh, Americans will 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 buy stuff or something. But I'm not too sure what it is. But uh, Canadians are more thrifty, and uh, so it's a, it's an interesting market. But it's it's different, and I think I didn't um, realize it was that different. Yep. You know. Yeah, it, it really is. Yeah. And uh, but Canadians love literature. We love books. But, but I think you have to capitalize on your marketing plan and uh, get it. All, and that get, wasn't in the plan. That's sort of it's like having your house built and then building on some other stuff later. And, and it's like oh and yeah. And it doesn't necessarily match. And we wanted you, a porch. I guess we should. And and adding on. So it's it's never quite as good as when you can get the whole thing launched at the same time and yeah. then you get the buzz going and and people have their choice whether they want to do audio or or do both like do audio and the ebook and then mm -hmm. use the whisper sync thing going on and uh, so that that's what I think the ideal is is if you're gonna do all the versions do them all at once and then you can capitalize on the the book launch the book promotions uh, and they, then they all feed off each other, because otherwise, if you do your audiobook six months to a year later, you've you're looking at you know are you going to promote the backlist now, 
just to get vibe in the audio. Because yeah. audiobook sales are, are about 10% of what your paperback sales are going to be. There's just because uh, it's growing, but uh, right now that's that's the economics of it. I I also want to talk about the excitement I, of yes, audiobooks. Yes, I want to talk I about... Love, I love and that. I want to talk about the fun mm. part. Like, what if there's somebody in here who wants to produce their own? What if there's a... Cool. What if there is... I mean, I, I know the pros generally are going to do a better job. But what if there is a, an author out there who says, you know what, this is my autobiography. I want it in and my voice, I'm and I think I can it. do a good job. You know, I've had some training in whatever broadcast or something. And I think I want to do it. Oh, yeah. There's so many, like, read by the author is, uh, even Stephen King, his latest audiobook was read by him. Um, I don't think he did a great job, but, <laughs> but, but still. But people it, who love Stephen King want to hear him read. Want to hear him read. And so read by the author is a big thing. And um, you you can do it, uh, especially the author who knows what they wrote. Um, because it'll it'll you know you'll get the meaning of every sentence is already in your head so, yeah. so you can do that um you really do need to find a, a studio uh so that the sound isn't awful you you can't record it in garage band and or on your iphone uh it the sound is so bad that people can't listen to a six eight hour audiobook of that noise so so quality is really important when it comes to sound. You can listen to a podcast on that that hasn't been recorded yeah. that well, but you can't listen to an audiobook for hours and hours. Uh, the the ambient noise has so to be. So it's a very really long relationship you're going to have with this. It yeah. is. And I found yeah. um, listening to the one that you did for us was right. much more immersive and that surprised me because oh, yeah. I I thought Reading a book, you know, I have a mental image in my head of what it's going to be, you know, and, and as we're going, and, and I'm imagining these things, but having someone else read it was an entirely different experience. Oh, how interesting. Yeah. I, I've yeah. heard other people say, um, oh, someone else listens to the audiobook. She says, I couldn't listen to it because I'd already read the book. And it conflicted with what she'd already been thinking. Oh, but yeah. But for me, I mean, I'd edited this thing. I'd seen it frontwards to backwards, and inside <laughs> out. And, I knew the words. You know, and I know the, the people for real. And But I still found that there's a whole new... It was kind of exciting. Because a, a narrator will will pick up a meaning or, or something and, and give it a voice. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's the voice. It was uh, a different experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, where you, you might have read it. Um, the thing is, when... When we read a book, we tend to skim over a lot. Um, like you, most people will speed read or yeah. will not read every single word uh, when they're reading. But when you're listening to an audiobook, you're listening to every word. Uh, and so it has a whole different different sense. Uh, okay, when I, when I was listening to audiobooks driving back to Ontario... Uh, there were some parts where I was, I don't know if I was zoning out on the road or what, and I'm like, what the heck is happening? And I had to, and back had to go up. backwards. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. What did I miss? So yeah. I guess you can, yeah. you can zone you, through some You can do that. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, did it, who and is this? Like, and then you, you How lose, do we get to the chase scene? Character? <laughs> and actually that for me is a, is a drawback of audiobooks is you, you can't just flip back a few pages and check something. Oh, who is There's that the character? There's the 30 second backup thing that I found. There, there is, but. You can push that a lot of times. You, you can do that, yeah, <laughs> but it's not quite the same as, fl as flipping back. Yeah. And, oh, right, okay, and then going, going and yeah, okay, now, now I get it. It's a little bit different. So you, um, the, the audiobook while driving is is actually less popular now. Really? It, oh, yeah. Wow. Well, for the long trips, I, I, I really loved, loved it. I was looking forward to, I'm going to drive, you know. I've got I'm 19 hours drive. of driving. I can almost get this audiobook I done. can do this whole 30-hour audiobook. But, but what happens is when you your attention is called away to the driving, mm. uh, and then it is not on the, the listening, you can oh. pay attention to one thing at a time. Yeah, um, maybe it's more suited for highway, boring, Yeah, long boring trips. highway is really good. Um, I've, I've heard, uh, the, like, uh, there was a study released last summer in Canada and I, I will have to send you the link cause I, I don't remember who did it, but, um, the people who are listening to audiobooks are like women 25 to 35 in that age group 
and they're doing it at home while they're doing well, another they're, chore. Yeah, so they're uh, multitasking. They're multitasking they're... And, and listening to the audiobook at the same time. So, it's so like... they're not listening to stuff that's really deep. They're listening to... Romance. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, it's, it's funny. The, uh, the, the big audiobook genres are uh, mysteries and thrillers, uh, and romance... And then self-help. But that's something that I really, really care about is pronunciation. Um, so one, one of my gigs that I am so thankful for is I read the Washington Post. And it, it's, oh, yes. um, I am the, the weekend voice of the Washington Post. Okay. Uh, Can I interrupt you? Do you use yeah. a U.S. accent or do you I sound do. like you? Uh, no, I, and uh, that is that is the thing. I got the job because I could do a standard American accent. Okay. And, uh, and I, I do it really well. So that's like a, a native act and accent now. But um, when, like, when you're doing the news, if they're quoting somebody and they give the name, you have to give the name you have to say it correctly. Yeah. And you you can't be like this is published on Audible. Um, it's it's for download. The Amazon Prime members uh, tend to be the readers of of the Washington Post uh, weekly, and so you will hear about it if you have not pronounced somebody's name right. So all the American politicians, all the uh, all, foreign like, diplomats? all the foreign diplomats, the foreign oh. names. There's a lot of um, so, like Middle Eastern and Turkish and names. Some of those and are a lot of syllables long, and there's no vowels. And or or there's like it looks like English, but those are not pronounced the way yeah. English letters are. And so you have to do you have to look it up every single time. Um, and what's your what's your resource? Uh, your, the internet. Your... <laughs> I, I, I literally Google how to pronounce blah yeah, blah blah. Yeah, person's name, uh, video interview, and almost always, if it's someone in the news, that will get me someone saying that name out loud. And, okay. Uh, and it's like I really score if I can hear them saying their own name out loud. Hi, I'm. Time consuming. Yeah. It it can get a little time consuming, and so for uh, like I do a, a finished hour of um, the Washington Post is is generally the weekend edition, and. For that, it will take me usually three or four hours uh, to research and record it, um, just because uh, so many so many names have to be looked up. Well, and there are some names or some some words like in Chinese where there are different tones. Or if you don't learn that as a child, you can't hear it. You, you can and only, also some indigenous words, you can't hear it. So you, you can't just hear do your it, best. and so you just do your best. And, do, and, it sounds like know, that to me, so. Okay. It's like pretty close. Uh, but but things like uh, one of the first <laughs> one of the first words I had to look up when I started doing this was Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who is the president of Turkey, and it is not spelt like that. <laughs> yeah, I know <laughs> yeah, Erdogan. Erdogan. Like, Erdogan. I know. Yeah. I, yeah, no, I pay attention Erdogan. to that because I spelling kind of sticks in my head. So I go, oh, yeah, that's, that's a match. Yeah, that and I remember having to do uh, one story. That took me an hour to research because it was in Irish Gaelic. There was like yeah. phrases that I had to actually look up the pronunciation guide yeah. and, and work out how these words were said. But you had to do it. And so I think that for me is why they like me, <laughs> my editors. from Can one. You do the research. Because I do the research, right. yeah, and yeah. I, I do get it right. And um, and so when I, like a, one of my side gigs is I will proof listen to other narrators. Uh, and I will look up their words. Uh, and I get mad when they, they haven't looked it up themselves. Well, the one thing you pointed out with the, with the book that you did for us was uh, mischievous books. <laughs> yes. Mischievous. Uh, Yes. Mischievous. <laughs> Although probably three quarters of the people that I've heard say it say mischievous, mischievous and I used yeah. to say mischievous, and um, so I kind of get a kick out of that. That I was kind of happy you pronounced it like that, and you're like, no, 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 no we're correct it. That okay. is wrong. Because <laughs> I started when I started the company, it was mischievous books, and it, it, and it kept coming up books. on spell check. I'm spelling it wrong because I'm spelling it like mischievous. Oh no, I always spelled it right, <laughs> uh, and I kind of did it on purpose. If, if they can't spell my mm-hmm. website, then they, they can't come. Then they can't come. So it is important. It's it really important, and especially place names, people's names, um, names of things. People take it to heart. When, yes. If you're talking and, about their town and you mispronounce it, that's a big, big you, deal. Yeah, you're, you, you've got no credibility now. Yeah. You're, you're nothing. Uh, yeah. You can't even say the name right. And, 
you're right. Pronunciation mm-hmm. is credibility. Yeah. So, so I and I, well, in the so the corollary of that is when you're doing a book with accents. So, um, like the um the nonfiction is really easy because you're you're just saying it all in the same accent. Uh, so mm-hmm. if it's standard American, you use that the whole book through. But if you're doing a f- work of fiction, um, it, like historically, like 10, 15, 20 years ago, audiobooks tended to be just uh, one straight. Like they yeah, wouldn't they're do, just reading it to you. They're just reading it, and they wouldn't do character accents. But that has gone full, full about face now. And if you don't do character accents, it's not not that good. And so... Yeah, I, like I said, I have kind of limited... Um experience listening to audiobooks most of them have been just kind of read but some of them have been character accents yeah and totally different experience again because you need to recognize who's talking uh, Mm -hmm. and and get that character in your head Uh, it's it's just all part of the experience is you know it's not just somebody reading a book and narrating it's the character is talking and so to get that whole picture you have to get a, a good accent um the interesting thing is I'm, I do a series, uh, I'm on the, I'm doing the fifth book in, in a series, um, the Louise Purley Mysteries right now. Mm-hmm. And it, I was even told the heroine of the book, who's in a lot of the book is in first person. And so it's her thinking and talking. She's from North Carolina. And yet when the author asked me to do the book, she said, I do not want a a real authentic Carolina accent because people think that sounds stupid. Um, the real Southern accent equates in a lot of people's minds with stupid. And this was the author telling me this. And you know, she's from North Carolina herself, so she so she says, I know exactly. So you want to do a like a, a Southern light. So there's a hint of the accent. Mm. And that's what I want to get you to do. <laughs> yeah. Because just talking about it, you're 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 an actor. You're you're not just a voice. You're an actor. You're an actor. And your whole body's involved. It, yeah. So you have to do it. Yes. To, to get into that. To yeah. get into it. But the thing is, if you're you're also reading, and if the listener cannot understand what you just said because your accent is so thick, then you've taken the listener out of the experience while they rewind yes. and say, "Oh, what did they say? What does that word?" And yeah. so you you you're unless balancing. you're from there and then you're like, "Hey, it sounds like my aunt." Oh yeah, so of course, yeah. the, I I every book I do for her, which is in the Carolina light accent, I will get at least one review from a local saying, "She's not even using the right accent." <laughs> it's like that's not a you know a good accent, but everybody else thinks it's fine. So. For the greater audience, it's perfect, and for the locals, they. Well, it's interesting yeah. that you you're the way that your whole body's involved in the acting of this thing, yeah. because as writers, we do something similar. Like if I'm writing a certain character, I'm I'm writing like this. Yeah, He's, your body. Yeah, and you're I'm typing doing, hard. Yeah, on and, and then if I'm, <laughs> is I notice that with myself, and oh. when I go to writer events, there's one coming up uh, on the weekend. And at uh, the Delta. Oh, yeah. And yeah. It, it would be funny to go in the room because you'll see everybody sitting around and, and you can kind of get an idea of what they're writing by how their body posture is. Oh, yeah. You know, and they're breathing and they're listening to, you know, they're tapping their feet and they're really getting into it. That totally it's different. helps, yeah. Well, you, like, part of the voice is you're not just doing an accent. You're doing the whole character. So you are, uh, your your breathing is is... Is how the character is. Sometimes, like if I'm looking at a character, uh, like you were seeing in my studio, I have photographs of the character. I'm writing that right now. <laughs> yeah, because that reminds me. Maybe that character is somebody who slouches, mm-hmm. and and you'll get a different sound out of your chest if you're slouching versus if you've got great uh, yeah. posture. And and you know, however you're you're gonna present yourself. Can I come in? Merle called out. Sure, Miss Osborne answered him. Merle entered our room. Do you two know that I am the only human being quartered in a four-story barracks? It's loony, he sniffed. You're drinking bourbon. Want some? Miss Osborne asked. Did you bring a cup? No, Merle said. 
but all it all helps. Um, people will hear hear that in your voice. Uh, mm-hmm. If they hear if you're smiling, they hear if you're not smiling. Uh, they hear if you're serious or not serious. So it's yeah. it's acting. Yeah, yeah they do. They yeah. do hear if you're smiling. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah they do. <laughs> I love doing nonfiction because I'm like my background is in science and like I have a psychology degree and I have a biology degree and I love nonfiction and in uh, and, and particularly science books and, and history books and things but I also love the acting so like doing the characters so I, I like a, a mix of fiction and nonfiction. You also have a little bit of a, an editing background don't you? Yes. So yeah. what do you do mm-hmm. when you're reading a book and you come across something that you feel you maybe don't think is edited as well as it could be, or you would have done it differently. Does that cause you like a hiccup, or do you? Yes. Do you? Have it to... kills me. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to be nice. <laughs> it, oh, it's really hard. Well, it, well, in fact, when I'm um, for for with the Washington Post stories, uh, the thing is, you have to read 100% what the story, like what is written, so that it matches the whisper sync. And I've, not, I've noticed a big decline in quality of articles and huge typos yeah. and stuff, and you just have to read that? Often. Um, <sighs> or, like, if, if it's really blatant, I, I fix it, but I have to tell my editors so they can flag it. So because then what happens is because it's a, it's a current story that is just going to get published, they will actually go back and edit the um, the print, uh, the the e story that's going to be published uh-huh. uh, to match the voice. Be, like if it's if there's you know repeated words or um, they miss a word, yeah. Uh, so or they use the wrong word and you know so 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 that you can but you you fudge it. Whereas with a book that's already been published. And you pretty much have to to stick with it. Does reading aloud you pick up so much more than and if, if they've, they've edited it but not actually read it aloud? Oh, you know what? So many. You could edit something five times and you will still print and then go, oh my god, I can't believe that got into print. Yeah. And so the same thing happens. They'll, they'll send me the manuscript. And uh, I know there was um, one of the Louise Purley mysteries. I remember reading it. And this is a book that has been published and professionally edited and mm-hmm. by, by a publisher. And I'm reading it, and I, I realized that they had the wrong character name for an uh-huh. entire chapter of a book. And it's like, who? And going back to the author, who is this person? I've never heard of this name. <laughs> and uh, suddenly, and it's because the author and the ed, between the author and the editing, they had changed the name of a character, but they had missed it when they uh, and it got published wow. with, with the wrong name. And it's me because I have to read every word and I have to assign a voice to every character. I'm actually looking at. The name and, and, and it's probably printed and getting the deal with ten thousand copies. Ten thousand copies. <laughs> so yes, it's, it's, it's not getting changed. That is not getting changed. But <laughs> yet you have to because it doesn't make sense. Uh, and suddenly you're introducing a character name that doesn't exist. And um, so sometimes you just have to fix it in in the read. Authors, you, you don't want to change the voice of the author because that's how they write. And so yeah. when they're I mean, grammat- grammatical changes change the voice of the author. So me, the narrator, mm-hmm. I am I'm just putting a voice to the author's words, and so I I can't change too much. Like like fact, real errors, you you can you know go to the author and go back yeah. and forth. And, if you've got like yeah. five sentences in a row that start with she, I mean, are you just like no? I can't. Yeah. No, you like, just whatever. That's what you, yeah, and you know some. Um, Authors will fall in love with a word, <laughs> yes, and it'll be used like ten times in a book, and you're just like, yeah. or more, or more, or more, and you're just like, really? My first book, my word was just, just, just this. I, it was diminishing. Every, it just, there's so <laughs> many justs in there. Yeah. So there's, and and you sometimes you don't realize it. And it's me reading the book out loud. That's like, you know, I've heard mm-hmm. that word five times already in this mm-hmm. book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, so I think that's my advice to authors uh, is read your book out loud because your your dialogue will be better because you'll realize if you try to say it, 
oh, that doesn't make sense. That's really hard to say, or nobody would say it like that. Or, um, so my, my advice as a narrator is to authors, please read your book out loud. Mm. It especially helps with dialogue. Oh yeah. Said, yeah. Oh yeah. Dialogue is. Uh, uh, you can tell when when somebody has has actually said those words aloud because they flow. They're easy and, and mm-hmm. they make sense as you're saying it. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. Well, when I edit, that's one of the my process. Yeah. Well, actually, I will read it aloud and then I'll have the computer read it to me because oh. the computer. Yeah. Is, is a robot and it doesn't phrase things how I think it should. It phrases it how it's grammatically laid out. How it's laid out and you're and, like, whoa, how did that yeah. sound like that? And so it'll pick up more things, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. And so you'll you'll pick up a lot of the awkward sounding things or, or mm-hmm. anything like uh, the repeated words that you've used too many yeah. times. Uh, all of that will get picked the up. The thing that you can see five times and you never see it. Yeah. The, the, Because it's a great word. Because there's a the at the end of this line and then the next line starts with a the and you'll well, miss it. Well, not necessarily. Uh, <laughs> the, the problem is when you're reading the stuff you wrote, you read what you meant to say yep. anyway. So yep. so you should have somebody else read it out loud. But, <clears throat> oh, yeah, for sure. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so if, <clears throat> if you're in the editing phase, read it out loud as, as you're going and then... You can just you mumble to yourself, but uh, that that will really help your your own self editing as you're you're making sure it's a beautiful sentence. And so when you're proofing your own material and you you've got your your text here and you're you're yeah. looking at your audio and and listening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So proof listening is um, it's a a skill that takes a lot of focus um, because. Um, when you're proof listening, you can't just drift off. Mm-hmm. You must be reading at the same time as you're listening. Uh, so it's almost like simultaneous translation. You can only do it for so long, and then you have to stop and take yeah. a break. And... Now, you do your own mastering. We haven't really talked yeah. about that. Yeah, so um, that's... Um... Is, that, is that something that anyone can learn, or is that something that you really need to spend a lot of time to master before you... Is that I, why they call it mastering? I, <laughs> mastering. So the the process is you narrate and you have a, a raw raw narration. Hopefully the narrator has done what's called punch and roll, which means they've caught themselves making a mistake and they've gone back and they've started at the beginning of that sentence again and and started fresh. So you shouldn't have to edit too too much. Um, there's the proof listening part where you're picking up errors and odd noises that, that crop into the recording. Then there's editing, and that is um, punching in the, the narrator's corrections uh, and doing things like adjusting the timing. Sometimes there'll be too long a pause or too short a pause. or um, uh, So there, there's that sort of editing. And then the final stage is mastering, and that's where you're taking the the sound and making it even from chapter to chapter to chapter, so you don't have to be, you know, changing the volume knob. Uh, the next chapter starts, and suddenly it's twice as loud as the, the chapter. Or a character shouts, and you it hurts your ears if you're listening with your your iPhone iPhone. But um, uh, the mastering part is to just bring it all into spec and so everything's consistent. Your, consistent your, your sound, there's volume, no, and your quality. There's no and peaks. Your... There's no, it's not too uh, too short. There's no weird. Um, there, there can a lot of weird sounds crop in when you're editing. It's background noise. So like much room background noise. noise. Do you, do you actually mm-hmm. add in a consistent room noise? Like which I've heard done, or do you? Yes. Is yours consistent enough that it's just that's how it is? Uh, no, that's how you replace. Um, uh, like, let me tell you, when <laughs> when you're recording, there are noises like you wouldn't believe. So your stomach growls all the time. Your mouth makes these ugly noises and clicks, mm-hmm. and, and you you can get sinus noises. You can get weird laughs and snorts and. <laughs> Uh, you might brush up against your clothing, uh, so you you actually have or to wear adjusting your seat. Y- adjusting your seat, you have to wear quiet clothing that doesn't rub uh, it, or creak. You're, you you got to make sure your chair doesn't make noise. All of that, um, 
all comes into it. And you can get a recording that's just filled with these weird noises. And a lot of the times you can just individually erase a noise or use a computer program that will just throughout the whole file reduce that mm -hmm. level. But most of the time, if you're, um, if you like in a pause between words, if like a little mouth click or something happens, what you do is you take exactly that portion of the, the audio and you replace it with something called room tone. Mm -hmm. And room tone is just the baseline noise that is already in your studio. Mm -hmm. You never want to take away all the noise because it's jarring right. to hear utter silence. Uh, so you have to have room tone and then you would replace all these um, things. So, well, or, or like if you're trying to replace a word or you're needing to increase a, a pause, then you would add room tone, um, mm -hmm. a section of stuff. So, but getting back to your question, though, about is it hard to learn? Um, well, because I've heard that some people, they'll do this part of it, but then the mastering goes to somebody who only this, does mastering. Exactly. And, and editing uh, is to someone who only does it. And you do both. So I do everything. Well, actually, yeah, you do everything. Yeah, I do everything because I learned how to do it. And uh, when I was starting out being a narrator, I realized I knew nothing and I took a course. And I was really fortunate that the course I took was um, available online, and it, but it was um, marked by editors and people who, who knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, that, and sadly, that course is no longer available. They mm -hmm. use, but, uh, oh well. but, but I took the course and I really, I really learned. I, I, you know, I paid for this. I'm going to learn how to do it. And once you know how to do it, it's very simple. There are only so many procedures you need to learn how to do. So um, once you can do it, you, you just do it. And, mm -hmm. and it's not that hard, but, uh, um, uh, some narrators just want to narrate and it's time consuming to do the editing and mastering. So that's why they farm it out to other people because they don't want to learn. They don't want to get better at it. And, um, and it's, it's all about, uh, uh, the, again, sort of coming right back to the economics of it. Um, if a narrator is better at narrating, then they want to fill their time with doing that. And so then they will hire the editing and mastering and the proof listening out. To, these are these are the others. rich people who can just afford to hire. It, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's why when I publish, I do my own design, I do my own layout, I do my own it, a lot of my own stuff. Oh, totally. And uh, you know, it's and it's funny when when you talk with small publishers, this is their uh, their greatest anxiety is controlling cost, and it's in really every part of. Uh, the the publishing industry so audiobooks are no different. Uh, well, you started out you start out yeah. and you're doing it for fun because it's something you like and then you realize gosh this is the big black hole that all my money is going all into. All my money is going I into. I need to try and yeah, yeah. so yeah. yeah. Well and you know as, especially with uh, with audio you can really get sucked into the next best thing and so you can buy equipment and you can upgrade your mm -hmm. mic and you can upgrade your studio and so my studio is still the same basic studio I started out with because it's functional and it works great it is a really good mic it's a really good software that I use to edit and I have made a perfect sound controlled space mm -hmm. uh, so yes my studio has moving blankets that control the sound, but that's exactly what works. And so, and do you have to kick everybody out of the house and shut everything off? It, yeah, I have to. I, <laughs> nobody, I, can, nobody can flush the toilet and nobody can get okay. a glass of water for the next three hours. My routine is <laughs> I, I turn off the two furnaces because the, the, <clears throat> like any fan noise has to stop. So I turn off the furnaces. I turn off the, um, the, uh, fireplaces that have a fan noise. I turn down the uh, deep freezer, like so that it doesn't kick on, because there's nothing worse than hearing the fridge mm -hmm. kick on and off in your in your audio, because that's really hard to remove that sound, <laughs> and you just have to re-record. And but, you don't realize how much noise there is until you go someplace quieter. Here. Until compared to my place yep. in town there's just so much background noise and i come out here and i'm like it's like it's really still. it's really quiet and well, the snow is also you know 
a you little can buffer too. So well, even even things like um, if there's a big windstorm, uh, you can you can hear the sound. If there's a helicopter that flies overhead, I have yeah. to stop and wait. Well, you've got yeah. bird noises. That doesn't they come depend, in too much. Yeah, depending what kind they are, you know. I'm quite like, isolated. It's uh, where um, I'm at, at the lake. The the blue jays. The blue jays will make noise. Yeah, yeah, they're loud. You'll yeah. hear them through the house. You you have There's somebody chopping wood across the lake. It echoes. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You can never go to the You're you're out of luck. Here you've got you know natural buffers. Here you've got lots of trees. You got mountains. There's there's not much sound. There's no traffic noise, uh, which is probably the worst thing for most narrators because mm-hmm. they're in an urban area and it's um, the sound of a car or a truck passing by. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to do this where we used to live in Calgary because I was right next to an LRT station. Oh, even just the just the ding, ding, general ding, ding, city ding, noise. Ding, ding. <laughs> like, yeah, the the ambient noise is really low, so I'm, I'm so mm-hmm. fortunate. Um, if I didn't live here, I would have to have a real treated studio. I, I would mm-hmm. have to buy uh, a, a, a studio. Mm-hmm. Uh, kit that that could do it but um but i'm lucky I, I just have to turn off the furnaces and everybody freezes all winter <laughs> <laughs> it can it can get cold <laughs> but it's okay it doesn't get that cold and the kids put on a sweater and then i get mad at anybody that walks uh over my studio because you can hear the the foot so they all learn to walk like ninjas not walk no no they have to go sit in their rooms (laughs) (laughs) you may not walk don't walk around Uh, don't drag a chair so they're loving your job (laughs) this is what you're studying well right right now is a teacher's convention for for our kids uh, Mm -hmm. and so they're not in school and so i we're having this uh head butting most days it's like be quiet (sighs) i'm recording and don't walk. Can't you go away somewhere? <laughs> yeah. no. So I'm cutting into your work time. Yeah, that's okay. Well, thank you. No, I booked giving, it. Thank you for giving me some time. Oh, you know what? Um, I'm I'm always happy to talk about audiobooks. I I, I love audiobooks. It's uh, it's I I you know sometimes you start a career and you it's okay and you you think but this career I started it and as soon as I did my first book I realized this is what I want to do I it's fun I, I, it's fun I love you're it. down there in this little cave all by yourself and it, it's, but it's fun oh it's totally a cave <laughs> like it's this windowless room in the basement uh, and you know it's uh, it's like the small padded room oh, <laughs> where, yeah. you, know, you know what I can talk about your books forever